Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to the batch video for Forgotten Dungeon from the website Royal Road. This video will contain chapters 41 to 44.5 and as always I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 41 Charles Blue Flame My bitter laugh echoed out through the tent. Agnes, my only witness, it took me a few solid minutes to calm down. Even then, my eyes were still of hatred. These bastards, they're simply telling us to die. I shouted, my teeth clenched, gums bleeding. It was clear that the royal army already considered their outpost for a lost cause, thus ordering us to deal with the most damage possible to the advancing horde. And then, graciously perish, becoming silent martyrs for humanity for the great good. Use whatever you can, eh? Huh? My mumble disappeared in the air of stale. The princess quickly closed the tent flap and drifted nearby. Yes, that's what the message said. Then I'll do just that. I'll fight like a cornered rat, if I need it, and survive. The heated speech seemed to rouse something in Agnes's eyes. She would soon return to the morose visage from before. Noticing this, I asked in a flat tone, What about you? Will you stay? Where there was no way in hell that our benevolent king would leave his progeny to the wolves. All of us were equal in the face of the ultimate sacrifice, as taught by the kingdom, but some were a bit more equal than others. Two members of the hawks appeared before me today. Their orders stated that I was be transferred back to the capital city. There was a muted anger in her eyes. It was one of those rare situations where the country orders couldn't be ignored by a rowdy princess. The mention of the kingdom's secret police unknowingly turned my thoughts to the late Tina's fate. Or, more importantly, the siblings that she so happily described before. Considering the quality of her talent, as they usually should show promise, gathering them up if possible would yield me some nice warrior material. I decided to follow this train of thought when I have a chance. Later, my mind switched gears focusing on the present. Alone, I asked after a second of hesitation. I I can take a few people with me. Lone Mountain Eve Peter, you? She asked, her voice getting quieter and quieter as she became aware of the answer. I can't. My words were sharp and clear. Your brother's. Yes, I exhaled heavily, being noble sure beat being a simple commoner, but we had our own share of troubles. Would I return alone after abandoning the outpost, leaving the members of the order to die? I smirked, both my head and my rights with the new dungeon would fall into their hands. This was a fate much worse than death. I was always called a black sheep, a disgrace to the blue flame family tucked in the corner of a useless order dedicated to taking care of new dungeons, years after the last one appeared, to return to their powerlessness to those grey days of boredom, languid hours of simply existing. No, I refuse. This is my only chance at greatness, and they would have to pry it from my cold, dead hands. I see. She swallowed hard, her head suddenly landing on my shoulder. My first reaction was to escape, but it was already caught and greedily hugged. Helplessly captured, I could only listen to her fuming princess rent. There was no way for me to win. Not fair. I would try otherwise, but both of them were with the thirties. I knew what she was talking about their levels, not their age. And, what's worse, they're experienced. A rogue and a mage working together are nothing to scoff at. Especially because I don't really know anything about their abilities. It makes me angry. Angry, you hear? She banged on the table with her free hand. I barely managed to achieve one twentieth level after this disaster. This is so unfair. A new class, then, I murmured, and the heat in the body scrambling my thoughts. Yes, a Valkyrie. That's how it was called, I think. Her eyes scanned through the empty air, clearly reading an invisible menu. It's still a warrior class with a curious addition. It allows me to summon a ghostly helpers. Many kinds. She scratched her head. There's a cooldown and they're a bit meh. But otherwise they're fairly useful ability. The perfect support skill for a solo diving. I can now detect traps, heal and even attack from afar. 
She spoke, her voice getting mellower with time. Her breath grew deeper and longer. Soon, I felt like there was a little bird napping nearby. She instantly shifted into her lap below, her hands still firmly clutching my clothes, her fingers intertwining. Why are you telling me this, I frowned, breaking the calm atmosphere. I couldn't move my body, but it didn't stop me from turning my face in her direction. Her eyes locked on the contest of worlds. You know that sharing this kind of information could easily lead to your demise, I hissed. There are always people listening. Please, be reasonable, Agnes. My class jumped up two more levels, even considering how disastrous was our last expedition. I had mixed feelings about that, but experience was experience no matter how it was gained. And unlike the princess, I wasn't too keen on sharing such sensitive data, even with the people I trusted. Her only answer was a defiant stare. It would be a bit more intimidating were she not settled down on my lap, gazing upwards. The air still the precious balance of our body heat and the silence continuing for a long moment, until a short cough forced us apart. We jumped back as something stung us, all jumbled fingers suddenly free. Adam, my silver-haired butler, was standing awkwardly at the entrance, staring at us with an uneasy expression. At least he had enough composure to close the flap immediately after entering. In an ordinary noble household, the things that he already saw would be death penalty, a perfect way to silence him permanently. The tryst between a noble and a royal princess noticed by a mere servant. Unthinkable. Thankfully for him, both of us knew and trusted the butler. Agnes was acquainted with him for a long time, while for me, Adam was pretty much a surrogate parent. My true father was after all too busy with ruining the political intrigue to deal with something as mundane as personally raising his sons. The task was delegated to the then young and energetic servant, and we were together through thick and thin ever since then. I slowly let go of Agnes's hands, which unknowingly ended up in mine and stood, a false smile full of bravado emerging from my face. Adam, it's good that you're here, old man, I bellowed, trying to keep my embarrassment under control. It was important to keep up appearances. Gather every influential individual in the outpost. We need to have a meeting considering the fallen tribe's invasion. I stopped talking, seeing the hasty, paling servant. People weren't informed, I asked the princess. No, of course not, we're trying to avoid a panic. That and the scouts claim that the army will take about a week, even two to arrive. We're not only pressed for time, preparations can still be completed. Apparently the same couldn't be told about the other forts. So we're stuck dealing with the second wave while they whittle the invasion down. I scratch my head, not a bad role, if we manage to survive. The problem lies elsewhere. The scouts claim that the invaders are numbering a measly thousand. They're lying. I spoke viciously. What? How do you know that? You know, I had a lot of free time as the head of the Order of the Fates Untold. My mouth twisted in disgust, remembering these times. Even our name sounds useless. He sighed, escaped my mouth. One of the few fascinating activities that I could engage in was reading the Kingdom Forces training manuals. Out of these books, there was ones that bought the scouts, the exterminator teams, mage squads, using adventurers, and some more. Not important. I paused for a moment. Anyway, the scouts are required to lower the predicted amount of spotted enemies by half or more in order not to damage the defending troops' morale. I cited with an excerpt with a wry smile. So they have one and a half thousand troops. Agnes spoke with a green little eyes wide open. She was used to one-on-one -on -one duels, not massive cluster fricks, and a hundreds that battles usually turned to be hard to be. At least in the game our kingdom's battles. I would hardly call them soldiers, but yes, you're not wrong. Maybe even more. I turned back to my petrified servant. Ignore the early order. I want you to find a soldier commanding the local fortresses, a leader of the Adventurous Guild Vagabonds, and the strongest mage available, preferably male, and the representative of the civilian rabble. I stopped to think for a second, and also one of the wealthier merchants. It wouldn't do if they were left out of the completely in the dark. My head turned back to the princess. I assume that you will attend, if only as an advisor. I asked Agnes and smiled in response. Yes, I should have not be a problem. 
I have to depart today, but an hour or two of delay is still acceptable. Maybe even more, we have at least a week until the horde arrives. According to the scouts, her eyes turn to find once again. After all, it would be potentially disastrous for members of the Hawks to be seen manhandling a princess. Even if we are already dead in the eyes of the monarchy. I asked a dangerous question. There are always survivors, Charles. Her blinding smile assured me that Agnes would appear on our little war council, one way or another. She departed immediately, and as soon as she left the tent, one of the hawks had emerged from the nearby shadows. A bodyguard. He was a tall, muscular fellow with a sharp face. His eyes were a bit sunken, creating a tired, sleepy impression. There was a grace hidden in his effortless moves, as he matched his speed with the princess's large strides. The type of movement was usually associated with rogues, and I wondered where the mage hawk had disappeared to. It was strange that one who was supposed to stalk the darkness was instead strolling in the open, and the other, usually goldy and prideful, was instead hiding somewhere. Interesting, but not important at the moment. I moved back to the tent and started my preparations. A shower, a quick breakfast, and then changing clothes into something more, uh, wholesome. The time flew by, and an hour later another servant arrived with the information that everything was ready. I moved out, the light blinding me for a second until they adapted. I looked around and started walking towards the destination. The outpost surrounded the dungeon entrance was really that big. Not much time had passed since the inception of the most popular type of building was still a tent. They varied in size and shape, showing their owner's wealth and creativity, yet were still dwarfed by the military structures made out of wood. The silvery planks used for the construction weren't ordinary stuff, tirelessly cut and scavenged from the surrounding vegetation. Our alchemists and mages already understood most of the weird flora's qualities after the countless tests. With them came the discovery that this uh, wood, I hesitate to call it, was pretty much fireproof and had much more durable than the material gathered from ordinary trees. Not bearing the stone as a building block, but still, then there was the unbelievable speed at which it grew back and denied other plants of either water or light. Farmers were already complaining that the planting of vegetations when not native to the silver forest soil was going pretty badly. Monstrous speed aside, there was no metallic tree outside of the circle of a purified manor stretching around the outpost of the dungeon. Our food situation was pretty bad, at least sustainability-wise. When adding the supplies that had already arrived with the earlier caravans, there was a low chance of starvation. We had about 200 warriors and mages, either heading from my order, serving the army, or working as part of an adventurous guild. Besides them, about 400-ish peoples, farmers, woodcutters, hunters, shepherds, cooks, etc., were part of the first bunch of civilians to arrive at our outpost, but similarly, a burden to the considered in times of war. While I debated the viability of our plans, our meeting place had already appeared before my eyes. I sped up and walked inside the large tent decorated with green and brown, standard military colors. Inside, a few of the most important policymakers were sitting around a wooden table. There were a few empty chairs strewn about, a large candle bra already lit in the middle. It was still morning, I frowned for a moment, lamenting the waste, but decided to focus on the important tasks. And so I spoke. As you probably already know, my name is Charles Blue Flame, and I am the military commander of the Order of Fates Untold, residing in this outpost. I asked all of you here to discuss an emergency that has appeared and to devise countermeasures. There is much to discuss and plan for. I nodded sharply to the gathered and then continued without stopping. First order of business introductions, as this is a hastily thrown together meeting, please give a few words about your position, name, rank, and if applicable. I looked around. No objections. Good. Let's start with the person known to everybody present. Prisoners Agnes Gaynard, royalty, adventurer, and leader. I smiled, letting the rest of the table stand up to attention after hearing my words. I noticed that Agnes sat at the best-looking chair, nodding slightly the surrounding people in response to my speech. Her current noble behavior reminded me of a cold mask that she always donned in public. 
Unlike earlier, she wore her light armor and traveling clothes, very clearly ready to leave as soon as our meeting finished. Gentlemen, she rose for a second and every person in the room froze. Each of them understood at this very moment that the contents of this meeting were going to be something really important. Agnes hummed quietly, returning to her seat, a sharp-faced rogue standing behind her, his sleepy eyes scanning the room. On his chest, a badge depicting a bird with widely spreading wings made it known that he was a member of the Hawks. Gainer Kingdom's secret police, an ungodly amount of daggers, or rather, their handles, were sticking out of the various parts of his attire. The black armor and pants that he wore looked worn but pricey, a complicated set of his leather boots. The person sitting closer to her was a muscular soldier, a nasty scar on his face showing a certain battle experience. He wore his epaulets with pride. A captain, huh? Seeing him as the highest-ranked army representative meant one of two things. Either the earlier battles were intense enough to cull the rest, or he was left behind by his superiors. Seeing as a down-to-earth commander like him was a positive surprise, I knew how bad the noble leaders tended to be. The plan that I concocted could be described as unusual in the best case, suicidal in the worst. Seeing the sudden shift in attention, the man in question coughed and stood up from his seat. Captain Molendere, temporary commander of the Royal Army Detachment. He saluted swiftly and sat down, clearly happy to be out of the picture. In the next seat, a rough and hairy man was fighting with a tiredness. His ransom assortment of weapons and armor clearly showing the adventurer's guild membership, including a somewhat rusty cleaver that he wore in his belt. His long black hair trembling each time he stifled the yawn. At the least, he didn't smell. These unruly monster hunters were infamous for their unwillingness when it came to not caring about the authority or breaking the local laws. I intended to fully make use of this quality. Looking around, the dark-haired man stood up smiling. Call me Lewis. Rusty Blade Lewis is my full moniker, but I don't expect anybody here to use it. Guildmaster Lewis, then, I asked. I guess so, the old man bit the dust, and since I'm next in line, he scratched his head, red tired eyes peering from behind the unruly hair. It doesn't really feel real. Saying this, he returned back to his seat. The next person had a heavy smell of herbs wafting around him, wore a conservative robe, a staff, and a weird howl-like head armor. Various symbols were strewn on the dark violet clothing, symbolizing power, luck, and nature. A few locks of grey hair escaped from under the material that his piercing blue eyes stared accusingly at everyone present. Master Vincent, whispered Adam. He wasn't very happy that I dragged him back here from his experiments. I simply nodded and turned my gaze towards the man in question. Seeing this, he sighed audibly and stood. My name is Vincent and I really hope that you can explain this, uh, barbarism. He snorted as his gaze pierced my butler, making him twitch, otherwise there will be consequences. He sat down, ignoring the presence of royalty. In the corner of the eye, he saw the hawk rogue twitching angrily, but a single, nearly silent no stopped him from his tracks. Seeing this, I bowed slightly towards Agnes, a small dismissive gesture being her only answer. We all wear masks, I mused, waiting for the next person. Only two more were left. Unlike their predecessors, they were clearly overwhelmed and felt out of place. One of them had a large world and bright eyes and a bald head. His hands clearly had signs of hard labor, and while he wore his best clothing, a strange combination of blue leather pants and white cotton shirt, it was clear that he was very nervous. Sensing the appraising eyes, he swallowed hard, trying to stand. Trying being the operative word, as he hit the wooden table with his leg hissing in visible pain, then forcing himself to stand, and he started to speak. Tom is my name, dear, dear lords and ladies. I'm the leader of the carpenter team, and as such the civilian's representative. He bowed deeply, and his bald head smoothly polished. I was told the issues of great importance would be discussed here. He gulped audibly, and, as such, I was told to retell them to my neighbors and colleagues. He bowed once again and sat down, clearly happy that his speech wasn't stopped, or that he didn't have to leave, at present in the company of noblemen and even royalty. What a time to be alive. The last one was a slim and delicate young man with just enough gold on his person to pass off as a noble. He wore strange skin-tight clothing made from monstrous leather. 
Normally, such brown attire would be seen as humble, but knowing the price of any monster's material might change that impression. His eyes gazed upon the rest gathering, while he unconsciously played with one of his rings, depicting a snake eating its own tail. On his head, a circular cap and feathers were sitting, mostly covering his unruly bronze hair. Seeing our gazes, he coughed in embarrassment and stood up. Merchant Utilus come up. From the Dross Republic, it is pleased to make your acquaintance. He also bowed ably with a different feel than his predecessor. I sighed quietly, internally yelling at Adam, Why did you go get a foreigner? This is the Gano Kingdom's affair. I hope that you can explain this sudden summon, Sir Charles. This humble merchant has a lot to do around the new dungeon. Despite sounding humble, I could sense the irritation in my request to talk. I guess he was thinking that the Order wanted to implement some policy, maybe a tax, and just despite his small-scale thinking, I started with a bomb. According to the Kingdom Scouts, we have about two weeks before a large army of fallen tribe goblins and orcs arrive at our location. I inhaled. We have no reinforcements, an order to defend this position, and our enemies have numerical superiority. At least five to one. A smile emerged on my lips. Now, who has any suggestions on as how we just survived this death trap? I stared at them for a long while, and as soon as they understood that it wasn't a distasteful joke, all hell broke loose. End of chapter. Chapter 42 Joel's Blue Flame A pandemonium. That was the word I would use for the situation. There was only a few people in the tent, so the ease with which they filled the place with a stench of despair was a bit surprising. They each reacted differently, talking over each other, changing expressions, or simply staring blankly. Yet, no matter what they did, it was clearly in order to cope with the harsh reality. All their arm-flailing, spit-flinging notions were reactions of the oncoming spectre of death. A total panic. It was perfectly understandable, though. The enemy that we were forced to face was no ordinary army. An opponent that could be reasoned with, maybe even bribed. Something within our limited comprehension. No, this was more like a force of nature, cruel and unforgiving. A horde made up of unruly mass of tribals, monsters, and wild mages. What's worse, unlike any other troop, their focus wasn't claiming territory, gathering riches, or defeating the enemy in combat. Instead, their army was like a cloud of locusts, focused on devouring all that was alive. Nobody could escape their cross, be it a simple animal, a god, of a merchant caravan, or a wandering high noble. This meant that a bigger and more delicious target, like our outpost for example, would never be overlooked. The dungeon, expanding its influence, was a clear giveaway, but even without it, a few hundred souls stood out with a sore thumb to the desolate northern wilderness. After all, the rest of the place was devoid of life and littered with ruins, bearing the occasional tainted lake. With the horde coming, various raiding parties would form and spread around like wildfire, greedily searching for easier targets, leaving no stone unturned in their zeal. Many called such hordes a disease in the raiders, and they were fully like tendrils of illness, desiring a piece of the clean flesh to devour. Any escaping civilians would be the prime targets, but the reasons for the hunt varied. Some of the invaders simply craved carnage. Others cared about harvesting our mana cores or enslaving the civilized races. Yet the worst among them were the ones who had completely turned into animals. Both their bodies and their minds turned grotesque, deformed, and demented, yet they were not always that way. Not many knew or cared to remember nowadays, but orcs, goblins, trolls, lizardmen, beastkin, and the other fallen races were once as civilized and organized as the Northern Alliance. It was a corruption that turned them into monsters, raising the strength of their senses, muscle power, and reaction times. This created a type of predator craving both a challenge and meat, relying on their wild instincts to lead them from one feeding ground to another. Only the most powerful mages and warriors could contend with them. Rare individuals or parties comprised of veterans could also defend against their assault. For the rest of us mortals, the only way to even have a chance to survive was to make sure that we had the sheer numbers needed to overwhelm them. 
something that we didn't have right now. That's why, despite having service and experience talks at the disposal, the king decided to unhesitatingly abandon his outpost and save his daughter instead. The land could always be reclaimed, the royal blood, not so much. Even then, the chances of survival of both Princess and her companions weren't that much greater than ours. Worse even, each hour of delay diminished them even more. It was because the fact that Agnes's bodyguards had visibly fuming, his eyes drilling holes into my back. At least he kept his expression neutral, so only I and Mage the Mage Vincent noticed his burning impatience. I focused my attention on the people present. The state of mind was important. I needed to collect enough boards to carry out my defense plan in order to do what I needed to gather both their attention and support. They knew that their lives were in danger. I observed the reactions gouging them against the earlier knowledge. Having a capable butler like Adam was really a blessing. No, how's that possible? moaned the dross merchant Otolus while cradling his head. An extravagant cap that he was wearing earlier had already ended up on the floor, forgotten. It was clear that the man had understood how grave the situation was. Like every trader worth his salt, he had loyal men guarding his goods and people, but it was clear for anybody that his control would slip the moment that the news about the horde went public. Such were the hearts of men. Tom, the civilian representative, was silent, clearly too shocked for words to escape his mouth. He hyperventilated, his bald head full of sweat, his eyes darting, hoping that it was all just a cruel, noble joke. It wasn't. I never saw a man who could sweat so much, his handkerchief already damp and dirty. It was quite disgusting to watch noble sensibilities or not. And yet, I rejoiced, his fear was useful, it made him predictable. The people he represented were a burden, a weight to be left behind in order to survive. And since I was planning to be their savior, that should latch on too tightly. Good. While the rest of the representatives were also agitated, their reactions seemed muted compared to the civilians. A clear divide between power and powerless. Captain Mullen Durie was mumbling something to himself. It might have been a tick, but he kept rubbing his hands on his sword a simple iron thing used for ordinary soldiers. It looked weird on an officer's waist. His face seemed full of worry, but also radiated a feeling of strange confidence. I could barely hear the words like last defensive line and heart of the warrior and show them our worth. I miscalculated. The captain seemed like a weak man at first, left for dead by his superiors and easily pushed around by his peers. Unexpectedly, there seemed to be something else in here instead. A wild, unbound spirit. It would be hard to convince him to stop worrying and just follow behind my back. And yet, I would have to try. On the other hand, the girl Master Lewis was smiling creepily. It was a strange reaction to the news that the bloody battle and probable annihilation was near. Was he a battle maniac then? That would fit the bull, but he sure didn't seem like one. I guess appearances could be deceiving. I was sure that the survivor of the adventure girl higher ups that he would be more concerned about his life. If I remember correctly, his caravan was ambushed by rats native to the dungeon, culling the unwary venturers. The defenders left their guard down, thinking them a common and weak monster. They were, however, damn clever and organized, managing to turn the tables on their unsuspecting foe. It was probably the first time that the aggressiveness of the dungeon's creatures worked in my favor. The negotiations with the old fogies would be impossible, but with Lewis, there was a chance. He was young, brash, and much too impulsive. Should I manage to appeal to his wild side, and he and his vagabonds would become my slur allies. And last, and not least, was Master Vincent. The old man was so scary that even I called him with a big M in my thoughts. Was this the difference in levels or something else? Who knew? Anyway, he led his own troop for combat mages, a rarity in the Gainar Kingdom. Most, if not all, people born with magic cores were, after all, promptly recruited after discovering their abilities, becoming a part of either the army, special forces, noble retinues, or various public organizations. 
because of the fact the people following the old mage were a rare breed, and pretty much the only wizard troop in the outpost, not counting the dozen or two royal army mages. Sadly, their levels and experience were completely incomparable. My order also had a few, but we faced the same problem. The man in question was just staring blankly ahead thinking about something very hard. His wizened face scrunched up in thought as he scratched the weird looking cap on his head every so often. His mumbles were much quieter than those produced by Captain Dury and completely unrecognizable. However, he noticed my gaze and the old mage smiled toothily and nodded, a clear indication that at least one person in the room understood why I had gathered them all today. Master Vincent was calm, so calm that I started to suspect that he was in possession of some kind of life-saving artifact, maybe a legendary teleportation stone. What I would give for such power? No good, my thoughts were swimming, no distractions. I needed to focus on the present, and so did the people in the room. I clapped my hands loudly, gathering their attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't gather you here without a solution. I have a plan for all of us to survive this calamity and even bite back at our enemies. My words, especially the latter ones, lit a fire in the military men's eyes. I would very like to hear this plan of yours, good sire, shouted Captain Dury, and Guildmaster Lewis nodded fiercely to his words. Yes, any plan that gives us a chance to survival is a good plan, he smiled wildly. Huh, so he wasn't just a bloodthirsty idiot. Then... There is only one thing that I'm concerned with, sir. Bottom decided to interrupt me. What is it? I asked back. Why are they here? He asked while pointing towards the Tom and the Otilus. I believe that our talks will be of the military nature, and as such the presence of civilian and uh, foreign merchants are uncalled for. His last words were full of poison and directed in a derogatory gaze towards the two men in question. Ball Tom only lowered his head. A somewhat comical sight for a man as large and muscular as him. It reminded me of a child being scolded by his mother. The merchant, on the other hand, had sighed and started to talk back. Listen, you. They're here because I need their health, Captain. I interrupted coldly, becoming once again the target of the shocked gazes. W -w what do you mean? The soldier answered clearly, forgetting his manners because of the surprise. Our armed forces are unbreakable shield behind which the common people of Gaynar Kingdom can take shelter. And what would you propose should be their fate in this situation? I asked knowing what he alluded to. They should escape while they can and leave the outpost to defend to us. He proclaimed boldly, squeezing the frightened grasp of Tom's mouth. It was a nice way to say that they should fend for themselves, considering the advancing horde that they would become a distraction and probably also a nourishment for the incoming enemies. I considered this possibility, but the cons simply outweighed the pros. Civilians are our previous workforce and militia material, I answered with a small smirk on my face. Workforce? For what? The captain jury asked, clearly confused. So, he added after a second. Where do you want to defend then, captain? I asked incredulously. He can't be that stupid. Um, in the field? While the battle would be a glorious one, it would be certainly get annihilated snorted Lewis while inspecting the nasty piece of rusted iron he called a sword. Or was it a cleaver? That is true, and since we have a lot of materials, I tapped on the chair made of the local silvery flora. I see. My gaze turned towards Tom. We will gladly take part in your plan, sir. He shouted loudly, exliciting a worry of expressions from other people, and one not so loud curse. My people will volunteer for the defense of duty too, he added while bowing deeply, his bald, shiny head dripping with sweat. The merchant then, sir, the captain jury asked, half convinced. I ask you, Otilus Camap, lend us a hand in this time of crisis according to the Northern Alliance tenants. I asked the formerly while staring at the young man from the Dross Republic. He calmed down considerably, seeing the others focusing on the future. My words straightened his back even more. I will aid you, sir, to the best of my ability. What would you have me do? The fancy hat was still lying on the floor, but the man himself seemed more focused than before. Well, a vision of certain death would do that to anybody. Twere three things that I need of you. I lifted up my fingers into the air. 
your guards and your cargo will be merged into the defensive effort. A chance at life can't be bought with no amount of gold, he smiled before muttering half audibly, at least against an unholy beasts. Good. I also need you. What? It was a calm Agnes that suddenly stood up like her rear end was on fire. What are you talking about? She seemed angry. I need a person to manage our stockpiles, princess. An accountant of sorts. I asked flatteringly, seeing her furious glow dissipate in the air like it was never there. Is that so? Then continue. She nodded, suddenly calm. I was left disoriented. Surely she hasn't thought that I'd change my orientation. I thought incredulously, mentally shaking my head, and then bowing slightly towards her, I continued. Then there is also the Adventurous Guild and Master Vincent's Majors. We'll follow. Lewis was one to interrupt me, and before a frown started to form on my face, another person spoke. My disciples and I will also help. It was a long time since I was in a scuffle, but we should do fine. There is, however, something else that intrigues me. That plan of yours. So don't delay and tell us about it. Master Vincent was staring at me with clear eyes, playing with a gorgeous embroidery decorating him on his robe. Yes, I will do, but before that, I need to ask you a simple but important question. Yes, how durable are dungeon walls? Strong enough to withstand the force of a fireball, but not the pickaxe's endless toil. The old mage answered in a poetic fashion. I see, I mumbled, before continuing, then how strong are they from the outside? That's enough, a stern voice interrupted my questioning. Any destruction of the kingdom's property, the dungeon included, is forbidden by the royal's law. Agnes's bodyguard suddenly barged into our conversation. His face full of fury cease. This foolishness that once noble, and all your family and everybody present will face the consequences, he bellowed. I was surprisingly calm, eyeing his armed form. And who are you to lay this claim? My name is Corn, and I am from the Hawks, he declared proudly. And what is your military rank in the Hawks, Corn? I'm a corporal, he answered, his voice wavering a bit. Then I guess you also know that when addressing a noble, one has to adhere to the proper protocol. I asked back, my words full of venom. Unless you're a noble yourself. I, I am not. I see. Then once again, on whose authority are you ordering us to cease planning? Uh, uh, on the authority of the king kingdom. He answered warily, sensing a trap. And who gave you this authority? I, I, I am a hawk. And I am a noble. So tell me, little peasant, what gives you permission to interrupt when your betters are speaking, I shouted. A mere corporal, eh? But silence! It was my show now. Who do you think you are, coward? I, I am no coward. Oh, you're not. Then I suppose we will see you on the battlefield, helping to keep this place free from the fallen tribe scum. I provoked. It was too easy. The man might be a high-level rogue, but he engaged in political debate where the goal was not the truth, but beating your opponent. I, I, I have orders. There isn't much that I can do about that. Good. He keeps discrediting himself. What a find. Then did your orders also include helping with the outpost defense? No, no, no. no. Were you just invited to this meeting at all? I came with the prince's bodyguard. I need no bodyguard. Calmly, replying Agnes, nice save. You came here on your own, Corporal, insisting that I was in danger, on your own volition. She emphasized in the response, and the rogue shrank under her cold gaze. So to summarize, Corporal Corn intruded in on his own in a secret defensive meeting and managed to insult not only the kingdom's noble, but also the kingdom's own princess. What do you have to say in your defense, I shouted, the crux of the matter already shifting from using the dungeon in my scheme towards his lack of authority to order us anything. But, 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 but the, the law! He still tried stuttering his words, fading him at a time and time again. A message from the capital said that we should do whatever is necessary to keep this place defended. Are you saying that your word precedes importance of the royal army directives? I... That's enough! Agnes said and nodded in confirmation. Leave. Just leave, I said tiredly, before I send a message asking for your dishonorable discharge from the Hawks. You made enough mistakes today. Seeing my iron gaze, Corn swallowed dryly and retreated before bowing deeply towards the royalty. 
<sighs> that was tiresome. I tired the remaining people. Now, let's start talking again without interruptions this time. Under my scrutiny, the men straightened their backs, while Agnes smiled warmly. This first battle was won. Now only the implement my plan and survive. End of chapter. Chapter 43 Uno I breathed a sigh of relief as soon as the adventurers left my domain. It was only a few hours later, before a dungeon call, any intruders, not to mention these monsters, were a nerve-wracking experience. Especially since I could only wait and listen, absorbing random bobs and bits of knowledge from their conversations. After they ended, I was observing how the dying thief was doing. Yep, Tina was dying. I was no doctor, but her grisly cough, pale face, and slowly changing skin were easy symptoms to analyze. The verdict was a slow and painful death. I guess the constant loss of blood and the two destroyed limbs contributed to her current state. It didn't help that she was also mumbling constantly, begging some non-existent entity for mercy and recounting... Her siblings? I think. Her speech was rather chaotic and erratic that it was hard to fish out the facts from her delusions. A shame too since something had been done to her by Gangria. She even called her a present. A fault like an owner of a pet turtle who helplessly watched its demise because the stupid thing bit an electrical cable and got fried. Tina's breath was slowing down heavy and laborious when the sentients left my halls. They instantly repopulated the whole place with libras and rattlings, and return, I felt like my hidden urge was quenched. It was satisfying, like taking a leak after keeping it in for too long. The only problem was that while the weaker monsters appeared immediately, the same couldn't be said about the decapitator, Jailer Jonathan, or the Guardian. It was a logical thing, according to many games that I'd played. Especially MMOs, but why is it happening in real life? The only explanation that I could find was that since they were boss like characters, then maybe their schematic is written somewhere in my core or on the dungeon as a whole, and because of that, they respawned using ambient mana? This theory was as good as any, since I didn't have any way to check it. Well, any safe way to check it, not with the sapiens breathing down my neck. It was a dangerous thing, since the first floor without them was ripe for the taking. Of course, any invader stupid enough to step onto the second would get annihilated by the Libra Exploders. I also needed to have a serious talk with the Guardian, both about his constant silence and how to use him as my living megaphone. He was, after all, pretty much the only being in my dungeon capable of directly talking with me and anyone present be it a sentient or rat. The Guardian was currently only connection to the outside world, at least until both I and said world managed to learn the squeaky tongue used by the rattlings. But that serious talk was a thing for later. Right now, I was waiting for an observing Tina's slow demise. Almost three-fourths of her skin turned grey. I predicted that when the process finished, she would simply die. It was frustrating. There was a source of new knowledge, new power, right beside me, and there was nothing that I could do to devour it. Nothing but wait. But of course, I wouldn't just sit down with my non-existent arms crossed. There was always something to do. My first order of business was strengthening the Guardian Room, making it much sturdier. The last battle that happened inside changed my concept of reinforced. Though the higher levels and powerful magic could very well literally break my walls and dig down towards the dungeon core, I briefly wondered why nobody did so. The next problem were the cables used by the Guardian to hook him up to my system. There should be an option to make them stronger. During his last battle, they were broken relatively easily, which in turn made him vulnerable, which ultimately led to his demise. My first choices was to use a metal or even rock, but it would end up in a straight pole, severely limiting the Guardian's mobility. He would be like a circus pony, walking in circles, while kept on a tight leash. This would undoubtedly cripple them in combat. In the end, I decided on making a large amount of small metal tubes contained in cables. They would clatter, ring, and weren't really that sturdy, but I simply didn't have any better ideas. So, 
I left the problem alone and pretended it didn't exist. A true and tested technique. Afterwards, I asked the rats to bring me some cloth food and water for the prisoner. She didn't eat or drink that much, but a change of bandages should do her some good. I also didn't take from the rattlings. Lately, we established a barter system between us to try something more than master-servant relationship. The currency we used was simply anima crystals. Normally, one would say that using my somewhat special power more and more. But the cost of creating these crystals was surprisingly minuscule. I was sure at first that they would draw much more of my energy. But under the constant nagging of the Rattling Queen, I summoned one as an experiment, and she promptly swallowed it whole. I was both shocked by her behavior and by how cheap the thing was. But the piece was always relative to the scarcity, so green, sleek shards of crystal that I produced were valued greatly by the rat kind. So the trade continued. Why even bother with this? Mostly of my belief that hard work had to be valued in a society and partially because the rattlings were steadily moving towards a theocratic model, and it was scaring me. If I had to contend with the Rat Crusades, the addition of a good, clean, free market should do wonders for the rigid caste system, creating a chance for the truly ingenious to rise to the top. As to what they were using the anima for, I didn't know. Not after the said queen spewed green bubbling fluid from her mouth, while the surrounding rats worked themselves into a frenzy in order to drink that vile thing. Yeah, while my appetite for normal food as a dungeon core was non-existent, such sights still grated on my nerves, so I chose to avoid them. But back to the more pleasant topics, I knew that the underground lake on the second floor had an outflow, which ended up somewhere in the wastes, probably. What surprised me, however, was that the small troop of rattlings managed to leave and return through the underwater river. Sure, some perished in the process, but the prolific little buggers already organized another expedition into the unknown. Preparing canoes made of axe conifers and oars carved out of iron bark. There was a party at the shore just beyond the reach of the glass progenitor, and they even took a few of the iron flame wraps with them. And... A canoe aircraft carrier? A large, by rat standards, flat boat with two of their tame dragonflies wobbling precariously on the deck. It was interesting, and at that moment I really regretted not knowing their language. Well, one more thing to consider in the future. Sadly, while I was still admiring their spirit, another wave of sentience barged into the dungeon. They were different from the earlier team, though. For one, they moved in groups of 10 or 12 people, with measured, solitary steps. Pretty much every single invader was armed with a spear and a shield while wearing leather armor laced with a few pieces of metal. And a leather helmet. The leader wore a similar outfit, but with much more metal added. A fancy helmet and a sword on his waist. He rarely drew it though, content with shouting at the commands. Unlikely the unruly adventurers, they instead walked in a formation, both as a team and as a whole group, with one of dozens leading the way and the others guarding the retreat path. Their coordination was so good that they simply mowed down my libras. They weren't much help when deprived of the boss's help, but a few managed to get hit or two in. So, it was then that I noticed the tired-faced healer that I understood that these were the professional soldiers, as if to show me their true worth despite a great beginning, humans marched forward with cautious enthusiasm. Still, they didn't overextend. They rotated, diligently making sure that each of the little teams changed the vanguard just after one battle. Their pace relaxed for a moment, and most of my minions on the first floor were slaughtered, and a laugh or even a small whistle randomly escaped from the otherwise tense faces. That blitzed forward, and not before losing two of their number to my hollow-way traps. The great difference between automatic ones and those operated by the rattlings, experienced rattlings, I might add, the invader's energy was added to my reserves. Tasty. But nothing special, half walk boulder was like a smoked pork. These people were just potatoes, filling, but still potatoes, without salt. It was when they arrived near the forge and the now empty guardian's room that I really tensed up. 
On the first floor, I didn't have any real chance to retaliate due to my mind crystallization. But once they stepped down, I would remind them what hell was. Too bad they steer clear of the stairs, my guess, as they meant that my guardian revival would finish unimpeded. The three groups left scouts every ten or so meters, which in turn lowered the number of each group to seven. These people unhesitantly entered the smith's column layer. It was rather bad on my nerves, but the surety with which they moved. At least each step that they took was full of wariness, even though the room was mostly empty. There was only one thing moving, the untiring if crude smith dancing between four points, the barrel of all the electric forge, the anvil, and the finished goods pile. Their fascination at the bizarre sight lasted for a moment. Then one of them broke the silence. Phew, I didn't believe them at first, you know, he said to nobody in particular, absorbing the red-hot sight before his eyes. It's a golem right here, spoke another, and it's smithing. Rare. Don't stare, people. We have a job to do. The team leader spoke loudly, clapping his hands to get everyone's attention. This worked, but he didn't bet on the golem also close by. It stopped its endless cycle of turning the armed heads towards the source of the noise. New visitors. Usually, the golem would ignore anything that wasn't a new kind of metal or some unusual material. So, I too didn't know what happened. But it moved. The bile golem strode towards the new speechless humans, its sturdy night frame peering over their figures, just as they waited, looking at the metal man's reaction. Not all of them, though, as one of the humans was currently hyperventilating. The rest had their hands on the handles of the weapons, slowly drawing the blades and pommels of their sheaths, ready to pounce. The tense moment lasted only a few seconds before the golem returned to his routine. The humans exhaled collectively as their bodies relaxed. Th that was scary, whispered one of them, still clutching his weapon, light gleaming off the sword's blade. It's because our boss decided to scream so loudly, another added, sending an angry glance towards the apologetic leader. My bad, the person in question said, answered Riley while combing his hair. There was nothing in the report about the sensitivity to noise. Anyway, let's continue remember your training. He shouted the last words while, still whispering, listing a chorus of angry responses. Shut up! Sorry, the leader's voice trailed off as the golem started to hit the pieces of metal with his hammer, the loud noise instantly making communication harder. Remember why we're here, he continued with a calm expression. Aid Jin take the ready-made items and haul them back to the surface. The militia will have a need for them. Norm and Edward are to wait until the golem processes more ores gather them, and send the runner back. The next shift will be ready in six hours, so try to keep alert until then. The men nodded and spread out according to the orders given. Very professional, except for one word of his little speech that caught my attention. Militia. What do they need a militia for? I had a bad feeling about this. Wasn't I the only target around? The team leader continued, ignoring my mute confusion. The rest with me were returning to the surface. Do we need to remind our living lamps to not move during their shift? There is no need, they're professionals, and they know what is at stake. I see. Then how about a little incursion? A large, muscular man holding a great shield smiled wildly. I've heard that there is a fork in the road that still wasn't explored. No. The answer was short and concise. We are a part of the Royal Army. There is no time for leisure. And what you're proposing is even worse, insubordination, but, but the money, and nobody will know, the giant pleaded. No means no, Psyche. Do you want to get replaced by some adventurous girl crony? Never, the soldier straightened his back. Then shut up and let's hurry. The miners should be on the way. I still watched as the group quickly returned back to the first floor entrance expertly avoiding the traps and making sure that any of the corridors didn't hide an ambush. It was then that I noticed that my words meant miners would be coming. I had an option of creating various metals and ores in my dungeon walls, but I treated it as a waste of space. After all, it would have made me a real asset to exploit, while helping the sentients to produce weapons and armor locally. I much preferred that each gram of iron be painfully transported from somewhere else. 
That's why my walls were either made of rocks or bricks, and covered in the dungeon's flora. Useless to miners. I started to wonder if the people mining walls in my dungeon would be dangerous, painful. No, that I thought about it, about the real dungeon core was still on the first floor. What if they accidentally found it? Damn! Emergency! Should I move my core, assault the invaders, or simply just wait for my monsters to respawn? And only then stomp on them? While I panicked, the decision was made for me. A large group of muscular but dirty men descended from the stairs while being led by an even larger and more muscular bald man. They all carried pickaxes with them, and they slowly stomped down the already well-trodden road. Wearing only boots, pants, and long shirts, and a sturdy leather gloves made them easy to recognize, considering that everyone else was both armed and armored. Unhesitantly, they turned left, facing a wall, and immediately started to take measurements. They chatted during their work, and I listened. Master Tom, you sure we should be doing this? Asked one of them, the larger and dirtier one than the rest. There's not much choice, my friend. We either do this or we go back to the kingdom. On foot. A tense expression appeared on his face, while all drops of sweat curled around his brow. That's suicide if you ask me. The miner answered, spitting on the ground. I agree, but between certain death and some unpaid labor and the possible of survival. I understand, boss. The man nodded, and the rest of the subordinates finished their work. Standing at the ready, Listen up, people, Bull Tom shouted while unfurling something that looked like a map of my dungeon. With a few red lines showing future expansions, we have a job to do, a very important job. A little outpost needs a four-bank position, and we're going to provide one. He smiled. So, work hard, follow the rules, and we're going to be fine. Sure, boss. Digging, digging. Let's get to it. Hearing these words of encouragement, the miners rushed forward, quickly destroying the ground wall and creating a new open space in the shape of a tunnel. Wider at its base than it was at the end. Is this wise, boss? Why don't the dungeon get angry at? Mumbled the sub-leader. According to Master Charles, it's the other way around. As soon as we finish these new rooms, the manor contained on this floor will rush to claim them. He pointed towards the niche they were working on, which was already two meters deep. They sure were fast, these humans. In the long run, this will make the dungeon stronger. And that's a good thing. Stronger dungeon means better loot and more materials, he sighed. Maybe even a smith column that Souls of Hope had found would experience an evolution and produce more than this garbage. He lifted up the metal. Rod? No, it was a dagger, I think probably made by the bile golem working on the forge. Only it would make a blunt dagger. I didn't even have the stabby point. Why, boss? Because a larger floor means more mana, and more mana means more energy to use, for casting spells when it comes to humans or revolving regarding monsters. He stopped. That's why it's normally forbidden to expand the levels. Dungeon calls learn to gain more power that way, and once they try it again and again... Tom shook his head. They often self-destruct. Oh, so they didn't know about the space limitations imposed on each floor. Wait, wasn't that bad? They are forcefully making me exceed their said limit. But what can I do? The entire floor had crystallized, not really reacting to my orders. Hmm. Let's just wait and see. Preferably no self-destruction will happen, I hope. During my internal monologue, the miners already managed to create a few meters long corridor, slowly digging deeper and deeper into the rock. Their movements were looking pretty chaotic from the outside, all the laughing, screaming, and huffing at each other's, but they were no denying their skills. As soon as the first group of workers started to get tired, another 30 people descended and seamlessly replaced them. Their work continued uninterrupted, and more tunnels and small rooms were being added. Some clearly ambush spots for the soldiers. Adding all this room gave me a strange feeling, like my body was being stretched. A rubber band, not so much as to break, but it was getting there. The worst part, however, was that there weren't any active cameras in this new expansion. The deeper they went, the less I could see. Inexcusable. This was my dungeon. I immediately roused the surrounding bone lichen and claimed the new territory. Ah! 
One of the miners shouted, seeing the greedy plant growing quickly into plain sight. He raised his pickaxe and prepared to strike. Stop! The loud scream held him back in his tracks. Don't touch it! But it's moving! Like it's a living thing! The man shouted back, still eyeing my creation. It's a normal, living being, born in a dungeon though. It was a bold tom that screamed the earlier order to cease the attack. The dungeon is claiming any free space. Leave it be. It's not dangerous. It's not? Yep. These little guys gather water and can be used to slake your thirst. He patted the plant, a large, bone-looking tube already growing on the side and full of water. With a slight exertion, he broke it off and twisted the cap, and the upper part had swollen down the liquid inside. Ah! <sighs> Nice and cold. Remember it. Your life may depend on these little suckers. Yes, sir. The people around him stood and returned to work. They too decided that observing was not enough. Right now, the new tunnels were being made by both the Rattlings and my manor. I was preparing space to install my new cameras. Well, I couldn't directly interfere with the sapiens peeping in on them was always an option. Even while doing all of this, one of my artificial eyes was always focused on the Guardian Room. The one that the humans casually avoided. I didn't know why until a few snippets of the conversation informed me of the deep fear that they carried. Fear spread wide by the adventurers who came before. It was logical, after all, and that the average adventurer and soldiers would avoid the place where the champions nearly lost their lives. Regrettable, though. The potatoes weren't that bad when you were starving, even without salt. My second project was a bit bolder. I started to dig a tunnel, starting on the second floor where my Libra barracks, aiming to breach the surface of the shortest way possible. Well, my first floor was out of the question. I didn't feel any compulsion to stop, so it was allowed for a call to have an escape route. The tunnel twisted and twirled, connecting with the various rat maids under roads and climbing higher and higher. I cautiously avoided already existing rooms and branching in a single tendril in the direction of the surface. There was a strange sound when I breached the soil, like air escaping a balloon, but it stopped as soon as the entrance had been covered with a rock courtesy of the surface rattlings and then a smallish but nimble copper wire started to extend from my network, a shy rattling dragging my artificial eyeball, staggering just behind it. It was high time to see the sentients were up to on the surface. Earlier, my minions had to describe what was happening, but being restricted to sign language and without using any abstract terms like it was going to be easy. Not to mention that often the rattlings weren't able to understand what they were seeing. Something was going on and I was very interested in joining in on the fun. Not to mention that I could go for some pork right about now. End of chapter. Chapter 44 Everything was ready. My network of wires curled just under the surface. More and more strands of metal were pushing up the soft soil back, like a plant eager to grow and blossom. My rattling helper was standing nearby, breathing heavily after that hauling. The artificial eye wasn't that big, but dragging it through the tunnels was awkward at best. Not an easy job for anyone, rats included. Ignoring the wheezing presence, I began my work in earnest, merging a single wires into a lattice capable of keeping the camera upright. The stalk thickened, copper growing rigid, and within reason, of course. I wasn't able to energize it as I did with the iron, nor was there any need to do so. Then I tried to connect the eye camera to the metal, delicate wires sliding in and out of the near biological construct. I got it right only after a few tries. The sudden influx of information heralding my success. It was a bit wobbly, like a scoop of ice cream perched on a cone, but I could see well enough. And so an eye flower was born. Now, to seed one all over the world. Just kidding. I laughed briefly and stopped wasting time on idle thoughts. Instead, my focus turned towards the pushing of the stalk through the brown soil, slowly moving closer and closer to the surface. The ground gave away easily until inevitably I bumped into a rock and forced me to change the direction of my ascent, and since the straight way up wasn't viable anymore, I tried to change it to about 45 degree angle instead. 
the force I exerted rose time and time again until I felt the roots appear roll around, a clear sign that I was closing in on my goal. A few seconds later, my efforts were rewarded with a beautiful sight. A beam of light cut through the darkness. It was a different sight than I was used to. Both the color and the intensity were much warmer and seemed in a way more natural than compared to the cold light that I was using underground. This pretty much screamed to me, life, life, there's life here. That's why I was surprised when the eye camera opened completely and I was greeted by similar plants to the ones that were growing all over my dungeon. Weird. Wait, taking a closer look, they weren't simply similar, they were more like identical. How did they even make it up here? I remember the ratlings describing a grove of trees present above ground, but hearing about it and seeing it are two different things, mostly because I imagined them to be of a normal variety, not the silvery types that I made. To make things worse, I was still trying to get used to the change in perspective. It was weird. I was not used to being so close to the ground. Every common sight gigantified. This made recognizing faces and guessing how big the buildings were rather hard. Now that I think about it, I could force the wire to crawl along the ground and climb up a tree in order to give it a better look, and not many people had the tendency to check what's above them. There were risks too, like a high chance of discovery, but still. After a few seconds of consideration, I decided to give it a try. What did I have to lose? This coppery wires would look a little out of place on the tree bark and even a silvery one, but that was something that I could do something about. A few swishes and swashes and a group of ratlings took care of the metal, covering it with crushed soil. The wire was still shining through, but oh well, nobody's perfect. At least the clusters of the proper grass growing nearby made the metal counterpart easily camouflaged. Now that I take a closer look, it seemed like the patches of my creations were intermingled with sparse green flora. It peeked out from behind the knife bushes and somehow just fit. However, if one considered this place as a bad field, it was clear that my own creatures were winning. It was a bit weird as I don't remember making them that competitive. Whatever, not my problem. The crawl had ended and I was happily twisting around one of the bigger branches and the silver iron bark. Now, I only had to hope that nobody discovered the creepy little eyeball hanging from a tree, like some kind of abominable fruit. I turned my attention to my surroundings. The eye camera ended up on the edge of a silvery growth. About ten or so meters behind it, the lush silvery green forest suddenly developed into a bleak wasteland, with a few sparse bushes and grasses barely clinging to life. It was a monstrous sight, but also strangely poetic, like the work of a mad painter, splattering shards of life against the overwhelming canvas of death. The wastelands were unchanging and monotonous, cut only with a small stream slowly trudging through the west to east, moisturizing the dungeon oasis, then disappearing underground. For a moment I considered how big was a chance to just have a water source present in the place where my dungeon was founded. I was suspicious, considering its rarity in the surroundings. And then it struck me, I scoffed seeing a gap in my reasoning. It was the other way around. This place was once a town, a castle built with soldiers, artisans, and mages. With people, and people need food, water, and shelter to survive. So, it was a logical conclusion that the location in which they prospered was bound to have access to all three. With time set, shelter had already turned to ruins. The food sources, both plants and animals, neared extinction, devoured by the unforgiving wastelands. But water. Water was eternal. Unlike something really catastrophic happening, the river won't disappear. This line of thought, however, made me worry about my rattlings. I had an army outside strong, loyal, and I couldn't use it, because it was starving. It seemed that while they stayed in the dungeon, their needs were taken care of, if I had to guess by the manner ever present inside. This wasn't the case, however, when they left the dungeon. Because of most of my rats had to scavenge, searching for berries, hunting small animals, and even fishing, all the while trying not to get caught by the sentience. It was unsustainable in the long run, too. This place was barren in normal circumstances. 
adding rattlings their beasts and sentience. Recipe for disaster. That was high time that I make some kind of nutritious plant capable of sustaining life. But doing so would mostly help the humans camping above my entrance, which I was unwilling to do. It was also hard to think of countermeasures. The most that I had planned was to make two types of food, something like a potato and maybe a tomato. The one plant in the dirt and the one to grow above the ground, which would be poisonous when eaten separately. I had a few problems with the solution. First, my rattlings didn't cook their food, which could be remedied. Second, the new plants were bound to gather attention. Anything that the dungeon made was studied by the sentients, so it was only a question of time until they noticed their purpose, and the correlation between the two fruits, or were they classified as vegetables? Whatever. It was the third problem that was the worst. My knowledge of poisons was superficial at best, which meant that anima had to be used in filling in the gaps, and that was dangerous for my sanity, which moved the whole idea into the folder labeled to do when completing the third floor. I switched gears again, feeling at ease after all this brainstorming. Was it still brainstorming when I was talking to myself? Who knows? New figures appeared in my sight. Humans. Lots and lots of humans. They were moving, swarming around, always busy, always loud. Like ants, I observed their skittering for a few long minutes, trying to get a feel, a sense for all this chaos. It was hard. It was hard to focus my attention since I felt the itch each time a worker underground shaved another piece of the rock connected to the dungeon. My subconscious was screaming at me to move my mana in empty space and claim it. And again. And again. Maddening. What, however, grabbed my attention was the fact that the people above ground were also digging. Unlike the counterparts, however, they stopped as soon as they hit rock which meant the upper part of my dungeon in this case. After doing that, they moved to the next moat of the moat. It was a moat, right? A long, winding hole built just before a palisade. Did I mention that they had a palisade now? It was incomplete yet, but nonetheless being quickly built. The parts that were already made did look a bit shabby though. If I had to guess, they didn't have anyone smart enough to make it sturdier. But then again, I wasn't an architect. As I stared at the place, trees were being cut down and stacked, only to be turned into roughly similar planks or barely processed poles. These, in turn, were moved as a part of the defensive line to a more various buildings. What was their purpose? No idea. The tempo of their work was impressive. Both men and women sweated, cursed and screamed while giving their all in the process. It was clear to me that there were only one reason for humans to manifest such unity. Fear. They were preparing for war. I grinned. Getting to the surface suddenly was a bit higher on the list of my priorities. All this energy together and use it to grow. War was a profitable business. Or more when you were a dungeon core. I focused once again on the scene. It was clear that the village above my head contained a large number of military forces. In my head, I divided them into two types. Soldiers and warriors. What was the difference? The soldiers were clearly a part of the military unit since they were working well and were wearing matching uniforms. Their presence seemed welcoming amongst the masses. The warriors were different, most of them carrying unique or simply weird weapons, with small parties of three to nine people wandering around. They looked just like the adventurers in video games. It was easy to understand that they were trying to avoid work, doing only as little as possible. This didn't make them any friends amongst the workers, and the tensions were naturally rose. I anticipated that they would be butting heads soon. But surprisingly, it didn't happen. People simply focused on the work, choosing to ignore the idlers. It was strange, it was unnatural. The human race I knew was much more belligerent than that. Should I risk a sprouting another stalk a bit closer to the main camp? Was that worth it? It would probably get noticed right away, and the reaction... The reaction would surely be bad. While in a contemplative mood, I didn't notice a danger coming right at me. Around the chaos of working younger, and all the children buzzed like flies, busy with doing laundry, cleaning, cooking, scavenging for food, searching for rare plants in summer withstood the pressure of my metallic flora, or hunting down small, scurry animals, similar to rabbits. 
and sometimes even taking on my rats. Yep, the children. Most of their faces and hands were dirty and bruised. They seemed like they were used to scavenging all kinds of bits and bobs amongst my murderous plants. They weren't used to the eyeballs growing from the orange stalks. Staring at them. The specimen that found me was a girl maybe ten years old, with two small braids on either side of her head. She was a brown head and brown eyed. Most residents of this world seemed to be. She also wore a pretty dress, but visibly weathered white dress with wooden clogs on her legs. My mistake was twisting around a branch out of the tree that was used to chop, folding leaves as weapons. Of course, people wandering under them would look up. Her already big eyes were even larger after noticing my demonic looking camera, and after a moment which felt like an eternity, she screamed. Yeah! A very girlish scream echoed through the encampment, eliciting an immediate response. The men ran to the source of the noise while preparing their weapons. It was useless though, not that I was a threat, but a goblin-like thing hiding nearby sure was. It was a small, greenish creature that shrieked in response, rising up from the nearby cluster of knife bushes and lunging towards the child. How did it even get there? Why did it leave the safety of its hiding place? And why the hell did it have three arms? All these questions were thrown to the back of my head as I saw the monster attack a child with its claw. The girl couldn't dodge, and a long serrated wound appeared on her chest. The force of the blow threw her back, screaming. She landed on the floor and started to bleed while thrashing around as the goblin closed in to finish the jump. Its advance was, however, stopped by one of the soldiers, brandishing a spear and a shield combo with an ease of a trained warrior. Protect the girl, he shouted to his companion. The one in the back quickly nodded, immediately taking bandages out of his back and immobilizing the still screaming victim. Let's murder this thing. A large brute was one of the people answering the call for action. A monstrously large sword dragged behind him. You stay back, vagrant. The royal army can take care of it. So be it. The giant laughed back and continued to speak with a taunting way. You'll change your tune when the bulk of the horde arrives. The goblin tried to flee using their quarrel as a distraction, but it was promptly cut off by another soldier. I had a moment to fully appreciate the beast for what it was. It seemed mutated in some way, with twisted features, toothy mouth, and claws gleaming on the tips of its fingers. On a third, rather useless arm, it was nothing more than a stump, not the powerful appendages that I was used to seeing in Mortal Kombat Goro. The goblin was not much bigger than a child, maybe 120 centimeters in height, and yet, with the constant hunched posture, it looked much smaller. A few pieces of rags covered the nether regions and leaving the rest of the body bare. There were numerous scars on its skin and bite marks. Lastly, it stank. Not that I had a sense of smell, but the reactions of the surrounding soldiers were telling enough. One of them thrust his spear forward with a warning, but the little bugger dodged downwards while screeching. A taunt followed only to be cut short by another stab from its blind spot. The weapon pierced the goblin's chest and its eyes instantly filled with pain. Another merciless stab followed, pinning the monster to the ground. And then it died. Overall, pretty good. They reacted quickly, cutting the enemy before it had a chance to retaliate. Everybody was happy with this. This was when, not counting the child's body, currently being cradled by her mother. She was repeating the words, Wake up. Please, wake up. Without end. Yes, the attack on the monster was too deep, too fast for anyone but me to react. So, the little girl didn't survive. People turned around and stood rigidly, glancing at each other awkwardly, not knowing what to do. The adventurers only scoffed at the crowd's reactions and turned to leave. All of these wandering eyes, it only took a few moments for somebody to notice my eye camera. What the frack is that thing? screamed a nearby worker. Demons. Save us! A panic quickly grew. Bella's tart. It's the corruption, shouted a white-robed man standing at the back. Soldiers destroyed immediately. We can't let it spread, he ordered. We need to bring new samples through Master Vincent first, Padre, answered one of them, while the rest shifted uneasily. It's the spawn of the wasteners, one of the servants of the corruption. In the name of the guardian gods, I order you to destroy it. The man half pointing directly at my camera. 
I made a blink. His reaction was hilarious. Yeah! He shouted, while clawing at his eyes. It cursed me! It cursed me! Destroy! Destroy! He screamed, while I cackled in amusement. And then the line was cut short. I guess one of the soldiers heeded his call. Too bad. My focus returned to the dungeon, and the constant banging of the miners and constant discomfort. It reminded me of how my neighbor was always renovating his flat. That was why I accepted the guardian's reappearance with a sigh of relief. It was something that I could use to busy myself. It was at this moment that I noticed with disappointment that Tina died. She succumbed to her injuries and a grey infliction in time and I checked out on the surface. In the silence and alone, her body was already cold. Then again, maybe it always was since she contracted that grey thing. That the thief's still open eyes were still staring into nothingness. I should probably close them, eh? Sanctity of the dead and all, I mumbled to myself. Yeah, right, get in my belly. I changed my decision immediately, and I screamed and waited for her to dematerialize. The sapien races were only good as a meal for my dungeon, and it would push me through the threshold. But you know, every bit counts. That's why I was surprised when nothing happened. I was paused as I stared at her body, and she was still just lying there, unmoving. I was beginning to grow bored, but then I noticed something weird. Her eyelids turned black, like black black, without any pupils, no other color. And then she sat up only arm clutching her bed frame and lifting her body up, with a feat of strength she was unable to accomplish earlier. Then, with a groan-like voice emerged from her mouth, I won't forgive, she said, mincing every word. I quickly used my analyze, trying to understand what she had turned into, because that, that thing was clearly no longer human. Revenant, damaged, named Tina, a type of accursed undead whose sole purpose is to haunt the living and exact her revenge. This being looks like a human at first glance, however, and a deeper inspection reveals a completely black eyes, great reflection, and most importantly, the unmistakable stench of death that permeates the surroundings. Revenants are masters of death, but that affinity manifests itself in many forms. This undead uses her newfound power to hide and ambush her foes. She stalks the darkness and uses two corroded daggers to kill and maim the targets. Her small frame may be mistaken for a child, making her easily capable of hiding in plain sight. The target of her revenge is the entirety of the Gaynut Kingdom, and she would do whatever possible to see it burn. Threat level D minus minus. Gangria, you crazy bitch, what have you done? End of chapter. Chapter 44.5 Wet Noise, leader of the fourth rattling expedition. The slowly rat will do his best, squeaked the wet nose while saluting. His grey fur and iron spear thrower were emphatically blinding today, polished for this unique occasion. It was not every day that the ratkin was sending out an expedition into the unknown, and it was not even of the above unknown. No. From the watery gra- the watery place, into the network of wet tunnels and unexplored rivers. The bad, bad things below had already been subjugated by the combined might of the dungeon and its inhabitants, but it still elicited a twitch or two from the more cowardly denizens. Or was it just a random rattlings? Anyway, Wet Nose was just a rat like that. To tell the truth, his reaction was justified. His very name came from the time where conquest was waged against the watery place. More so, when a glorious battle against the glossy snakes was being fought, blood, sweat and squeaks filled the air. And yet for Wet Nose, a most important memory of the day was one of drowning, of being dragged into the depths of the unrecognizable horrors, to never again see the Queen Mother and his ratty brothers. And then he was saved, his nose wet from the tears and the lake water. As a reminder of his shameful display of that day, he was known as Wet Nose, which was both a rare and strange cause of action, as not many of the rattlings had ever earned a name. Bad as it was, the name remained a sore surprise. Was it why he volunteered for this expedition? Him, a rat deathly afraid of rivers and lakes, or any source of water deeper than a few centimeters? Nope. It was a master scout and silent council that had decreed so. 
and with this decision, only volunteering was left, or death. Sometimes Wetnose thought death was preferable, and today was one of those days. For the glory of the Creator, the slowly rat serves until his death. He squeaked once again, a frail leader of twenty rattlings. His new subordinates were mostly busy with looking grimly at the wild current flowing by. The atmosphere indicated that every rat on board of the flotilla would rather prefer to fight with some of the adventurers than traverse the hellish waterway. The underground river, if one could call it that, began to barely be eighty centimeters high or filled the tunnel. Its flow was fast and random, endangering the makeshift boats made from the local plants and things stolen from the tall one's camp. No sane person would ride them willingly. There were five such contraptions with wide, flat decks and wooden edges, protruding only a centimeter above the water table. Each of them had a steering paddle attached on the far end and carried some pieces of food strapped to the deck. Due to their experience on the surface, rats already knew that leaving the safety of the dungeon meant exposing to hunger and thirst. Out of the five boats, three were carrying five ratlings each, most of them soldiers, with a few crafters thrown in. These scholarly rats were looking especially desperate, their wild eyes starting from the water towards the crazily laughing captains. The leading watercraft had only two scouts on board, while the ship on the far back carried two dragonflies, their pilots, and a navigator. The slowly rat will do his best, wet nose whimpered once again, eyeing his superiors with puppy eyes. Please, let me stay, he screamed silently. The dungeon blesses you, child, the queen mother said while motioning him to depart. Her intention was clear and wet nose could nearly hear her. Real intention. Frack off and get to your mission, or die trying. Just don't waste my time. Sighing and coming to terms with his fate, the unwilling expedition leader boarded the second boat. It was close enough to the front to safely give orders, and yet far enough for the others to die first in case of some trouble. The thought of the elegant solution. As the flotilla left the shore, he waved furiously at his two friends standing nearby. They responded with loud squeaks. They were simple workers whose sole emotion that they felt right now was relief. Neither of them had been named, as it was kind of a rarity in rattling society. Yet, considering only wet nose and bronze had the dubious honor to gain individuality, they would much prefer a long and boring life as a blaze of glory. The inevitable death. Wet nose was a reminder of rat cowardice. Bronze, on the other hand, was a shield that defended the fellow rattlings. A handsome and powerful individual with a rare bronze-looking fur. Yet none of them mattered if they were to be thrown out like used goods. Bronze being so headstrong could be the reason for becoming a leader of the earlier expedition, mused wet nose. Why me then? I'm a nobody. His panicking inner thoughts weren't exposed with his subordinates, though. We're ready to start, leader, squeaked the navigator, eagerly waiting for the signal to begin. Unlike most rats, they weren't afraid of the water and even revered the dangerous currents instead. This one orders, do it. Retno spoke in his usual tone, closing his eyes from fear. Yet, on the outside, he instead sported a charming and wise figure. Inside, oh, inside, he was still screaming out his grievances. I understand that the last three expeditions failed, and so it's the ratling's way to send yet another one. He yelled angrily. I understand, but... Oh, for heavens of the Creator, why me? His last words filled with resignation. It was simple, really. Due to how many rattlings were born in the tunnels and getting crowded, that meant that the expansion was a must. Thus, the devouring tunnel, as the common rats call it the waterway, was a good way to get rid of the surplus and maybe even conquer some new lands. The members of the Secret Council even decided that whoever managed to conquer the route out of the dungeon would be granted an audience with the Creator. A rare honor. And since it was the Scout's turn to choose, unlike his predecessors, he simply decided on a rat who had numerous brushes with death and yet managed to survive all of them. The one called Wet Nose. It was an incomprehensible choice for his fellow Council rats, but the person in question trusted his intuition. Besides, what did he have to lose? It was just a game. This was, however, unknown to Wetnose himself. 
He was more focused on the simple fact of being chosen as a leader meant working hard and shouldering the sudden responsibility to be best of his ability. Thus, with wet noses, small, lard, and a flotilla drifted a few meters forward and was immediately snatched by the greedy current. A small tunnel they traversed was half filled with water and much too claustrophobic for any of the bigger to be fit in. The various twists and turns made it even impossible to move through without some kind of water breathing ability, and preferably a lack of bones. Or somebody could just go the hard way and squeeze a flotilla of rats guided by mad navigators and hope that some of them survived the journey. <laughs> It was then when he heard his navigator's high-pitched laugh. Red Nose understood what the leader's job included. Grab the railings, people, he screamed, hopefully loud enough to reach the other vessels. Grab your dear life, for the creator's sake, this one orders. His voice echoed as the rock after rock expanded from the thin air and immediately disappeared behind them. How we were still alive, he thought to himself while observing the nearly supernatural movements of his navigator. Yeah! One of the soldier's claws had suddenly loosened, and the poor fellow was flew through the air, screaming until a second later with a wet crunch, and a sound silenced him forever. We're going to die! Keep it together! Not like this! Not like this! Claws on the railing! Breathe! Claws on the railing! Oh, creator, please guide this wayward soul! Frack, frack, frack! Crew's reactions to a certain death varied. But for Wet Nose, hearing them cry, oh, it meant that he was still alive. He was much more concerned about the silent scout ship. Still, he could see the silhouette of two moving on board, so at least somebody was alive out there. It isn't so bad, he thought himself in relief. Just as he was coming to terms with the situation, his navigator cried out, Rapids! This one doesn't understand. What the hell do you mean by rapids? Wet Nose was confused. Where Frecht leader, the rat had a manic grin on his face, a grin that meant that he was ready to die and welcomed it. Now I understand why nobody returns from the tunnel. And then all hell broke loose. The rest of the parade was broken pictures. Rat screaming, a boat crashing to bits by the current, and the dragonflies downing helplessly, while the pilot dived after it, and it never surfaced. The navigator singing, someone praying to the creator. And finally... A large rock appearing from the foaming water, right in their path. The rest was consumed by darkness. At least until Wet Nose woke up on the riverside, hurt but alive. Some of his subordinates were also there, slowly returning to consciousness. Around him, pieces of wood and other flotsam danced on the now peaceful waves. Unknowingly, to anyone present, the blue box appeared. If Uno was here to read it, he would laugh gleefully knowing that his creatures would glow more and more powerful on their own. Sadly, that discovery had to wait. Wet Nose Iron Rattling Spear Thrower had evolved into Wet Nose Fate Twister. When he came to, the first thing he saw was, uh, cattails. What's what they were called? Tall, sturdy and stiff plants with brown growth and tall top and a green brown white leaves. It was a sea of cattail-like plants, to be exact. He breathed in the air, happily to be alive, only to cough heavily, throwing up some water. Above the survivors, a cave seeding with suspicious light, giving crystals, was covering the horizon. It looked far away, but they were still underground. Behind a small snippet of rocky beach, they landed on the wild river stagnated into another lake. Most of all, the air was thick with manna. The taste was not dissimilar to the home dungeon, but still not completely the same. Just great, thought Wet Nose. I just had to be in a bad, bad monster lives down here. And then he wrinkled his nose. This place sure stinks, he murmured. The stench of rotting plants, brackish water, and unmistakable rotting meat suffused the whole place. Standing up was hard, but being out here in the open seemed like an even worse solution. At least, the rest of his crew were already waking up, most of them in worse shape than their leader. Twisted ankles, cracked teeth, damaged skin, and a torn tails plagued the survivors. But at least, they were alive. Only six rats made it out. Six rats and a dragonfly. The thing stared at the rattlings warily, its pilot already lost under the waves. What's worse, one of the wings had been cracked during the journey and grounding it, and making the flying impossible in the short run. 
but while the others considered kidding it for meat, Wet Nose simply waltzed right up to it and started to pull at up the halter. Seeing a confused gazes of his subordinates, he explained, The dragonfly may not be able to fly right now, but it's still useful as a beast of burden, or even a war potential. He caressed the insectoid head of the monster. Besides, all its legs are intact. We can carry our wounded this way. He smiled shyly and the rattlings conceded. Nobody addressed the elephant in the room. The dragonflies could only be tamed by the riders. Left alone, they reverted to the wild behavior. And yet, somehow this specimen accepted Wet Nose as its new rider? Talk about ridiculous. The five underlings quickly gathered any useful tools and food left from the shipwreck. There wasn't much to save, but then again there weren't many supplies on the boats in the first place. They had more pressing concerns. Finding a place to rest scouting the area and, more importantly, just surviving. More rats will be coming, that was certain, as the secret council's persistence was known to all rat kind. They had a cave to niche in this place, wherever it was. One of the scouts managed to survive, a small, nimble creature taught in the ways of silence and subterfuge. Wet Nose immediately asked it to check the surroundings, making a priority of finding a potential base location. Tunnels would be nice, the unlucky leader murmured, and maybe a bigger cavern to house the dragonfly, then the water and food in proximity. The rest of the subordinates huddled together behind the plants. Shaking off the water, the tamed monster also crouched nearby more for the company than any real need. One of the crafters cautiously set the cracked wings straight, the same treatment given to any of the wounded rats. Still, it was only a temporary solution. And then they waited, cave seeding up high, glistening with a constant mysterious light, never-ending dusk ruled in this place. What interrupted the rest was a panicked scout shouting out of the bushes, Snakes! He squeaked in terror, immediately hiding behind his compatriots. Defensive position, screamed Wet Nose. Remember your training. He added the rest of the rats automatically spread out in a half circle. Spear throws ready to fire at the incoming threat. Even the scout somehow regained enough control to join the survivors. Their eyes scanned the tightly growing plants, trying to pierce the living wall. Silence descended on the small group. Scout's heavy breathing only sound that they could hear. And then the enemy came to view the trio of serpents slithering through the mud, forked tongues tasting the air. Each of them stood twice as tall as a common rat, their eyes glinting with greed at the sight of what they perceived as easy prey. The one leading them had a blue belly with green scales covering the rest of its elongated body. The two others flanking it were completely green with visibly smaller specimens. Their arrival was completely silent. Were it not for the scouts warning, the expedition's remnants would be completely taken by surprise. Both sides sized the opponents for a single moment before jumping into the inevitable battle. Unlike the sentients, these monsters had no need for diplomacy or subterfuge. Their might would decide who would end up today's dinner. The first exchange was awfully one-sided. The rattling shot their spears, wounding two of the attackers and outright getting one. Serpents weren't discouraged by the losses, though, lunging forward with widely stretched mouths, their fangs dripping with venom. The blue snake was visibly more skilled. It avoided the claws and teeth of the defending rats and bit in the underway soldier on the leg. The rattling trembled and mere seconds succumbed to the paralytic poison. Eyes gazing over. His green-scale compatriot wasn't so lucky, though. One of the spears stuck into its flesh and already severed the limiting its mobility. A few of the additional attacks burned it to the ground, where it was simply mutilated by a frenzied rats. Seeing this turn of events, the only surviving monster grabbed its victim and started to retreat. Yet while it was focused on the armed opposition, an attack came from its blind spot. The formerly still dragonfly extended its insect head and took a bite out of its body, eliciting a hiss of pain. It was enough of a distraction for the rest of the rats to charge recklessly forward, tearing chunks of meat from the serpent. With a roar, the snake freed itself from the assailants and started to escape. A singular spear threw through the air and skewered the head at the moment. Rattlings froze at the sudden attack. The heads turned towards the direction from which it appeared, only to see the gigantic bronze furred rat smiling at them, the countless barely healed scars on his body. A crazed look and enormous muscles didn't inspire confidence in the survivors, though. They warily watched him approach, 
only for an awkward silence to be broken by the leader. Bronze! You're still alive. This little rat couldn't be happier. Red Nose squealed while running forward to hug the giant rattling. The new visitor looked startled for a moment but recognized the incoming rat and the tension dissipated. Red Nose! Of all the rats in the world! You're the last I would expect to lead an expedition to the unknown, he ordered, his voice deep and growling. Don't remind me, the slowly one was chosen. The smaller rat shook his head in despair, changing the mood, but a smile blossomed on his snout a moment later. At least you're here. Now we truly have hope of survival. Yes, yes, little brother. The giant smiled shyly. It is hard to live in such a hellish place, but together. Together we shall conquer it and name it after the creator. The bellows roused something in the surrounding warriors, their eyes suddenly hoping for more than place to rest. This one would be happy with just a peaceful and dry resting place, mumbled Wet Nose quietly, so quietly that nobody managed to hear him. Follow me, we need to administer an antidote to the one button. At worst, the commotion might be drawn more of them in. Or of all the tall short ones, he added mysteriously. Yes, yes, nodded the expedition leader. Get the wounded and paralyzed of the dragonfly, and don't forget to butcher the snakes. His head turned, Please lead as this rat will follow. He bowed quickly, and in the meantime his subordinates busied themselves while eyeing the warily the still monster. The tamed insect, however, regarded them with a calm indifference, still chewing on a piece of meat wrenched from the snake's body. The group organized their meager belongings and walked in a single file towards the promised safety. Bronze was leading them quickly, but warily. An hour later, they arrived at a small cave entrance hidden behind a few large but twisted leafless trees, their roots made from a quiet, lovely labyrinth, something that every rat could appreciate. Thankfully, the cave propped up was large enough to house both the new occupants and the tamed monster. The wounded were taken care of properly, poisoned given antidote, and the hungry had their bellies filled. Thus, in the safety of the new home, questions brewed in the heads of those who managed to survive, and most of them were answered. Bronze talked slowly, but surely, like each word was a precious coin that he loathed to part with. His deep voice echoed off the walls as the rats gathered around him in the burning fire. He spoke about the three earlier expeditions, about the battles against the constant stream of snakes assaulting them and the strange two-legged beings who had turned the simple hunts into three-way war, about the painful losses, new poisons that they discovered, and simple dull things that they had did for survival, about learning about the enemy and waiting for the unavoidable reinforcements, about lonely patrols searching for survivors and supplies, finding bodies, and scavenging the even cannibalizing, about rats dying left and right while learning about dangers and braving the mud, about the constant struggle and planning, constant planning and the great revenge. This place is huge, said Bronze, staring into the flames. We managed to scout most of the outer ring, but the way towards the middle is guarded by the stronger and stronger creations. There is even a snake that looks like the tall ones. He shook his head. These serpents, they spawn continuously, reminding me of our home. The rats whispered, one of them bold enough to speak up. It's blasphemy, brother. There is no second place like the blessed home. The speaker curled up, seeing the madness in the larger warrior's eyes. I know, this place is wrong, full of manna, but wrong. Not at all like our home. He snuck relaxed, remembering his birthplace once again. But the way it creates is similar, and... Uh, I saw chains, chains with words on them, binding something, someone, in place. He stopped for a moment, taking a deep breath, and it looked similar to the creator. A bunch of gasps emerged from the newcomer's mouths. He stared incredulously at the giant rattling, waiting for his next words. It was no nose that broke the charm. This simple rat has to ask then, what are you planning? Bronze grinned, but that answered him was a different voice coming from the entryway. We're trying to break the chains. The dungeon core has a right to be free. The scarred, one-eyed rat answered in a cheeky tone. Behind him, ten more ratlings were slowly making their way into the cave. We wanted to wait for more of our brothers to arrive. But with the dragonfly... Yes. With the dragonfly, we can do it. You think so? As soon as the wing is healed, we can start our attack. 
The tall short ones are growing lax nowadays, since we're getting most of the snakes. A wild grin appeared on his snout. The slowly one acquiesces, Red Nose answered with his own smile. In the background, both the veterans and newcomers cheered with bloodthirsty expressions. End of chapter. And that concludes the video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the channel, there are numerous ways to do so below. I'll see you all in the next video, and I hope that you all have a good one. Until then, cheers.